if not through censorship, I mean, I, I think there's an argument to be made to remove untrue information. In what ways can the Canadian government effectively make sure that social media companies are not going to be vulnerable to these types of attacks? So what we're eavesdropping in on here today is the Standing Committee on National Defense. And they seem to be very interested in the topic of censorship. Links to all expert witnesses are in the description below, uh, as well as the link to the original Pearl View session. A little bit of relevant preamble is included, then it moves on to question and answer period. This video is a little long, but everything in it is important. So let's listen in. Russia's disinformation campaign has been hindered by sanctions that have removed Russian media from our airwaves, but they are still prevalent on social media and in forums frequented by adherents of other kinds of populist conspiracy. The weapon of disinformation is not going away. And one of the lessons of sanctions research is that sanctions become less effective over time. So we should affect, expect this to be an ongoing threat from Russia. Canada is a target as a member of NATO, but also as a longstanding supporter of Ukraine as personified in the Deputy Prime Minister, Christia Freeland. Russian disinformation campaigns connect the invasion of Ukraine to QAnon and other deep state conspiracy theories that feed hate crimes and distrust of the Canadian government. A concrete example are the recent QAnon claims that President Putin endorsed the sovereign authority of Ramona Didulo, the self-styled Queen of Canada QAnon adherent. So this is the crackpot conspiracy uh, theorist that they're uh, using to strip and remove and censor all of us. So there's obviously some money behind this operation. So to this end, I would say follow the money. Somebody's backing her up. The attractiveness of conspiracy theories has been increased by the COVID-19 pandemic and will be increased even more by Russian misinformation, whether targeted directly at Canada or not. Certainly there's a risk that these adherents of these conspiracy theories will commit violent acts. But the political action of supporters of popular populist extremism can also have harmful effects that don't escalate to the level of security threat or crime. We saw examples of this in the recent trucker convoy in Ottawa, where traffic prevented ambulances from leaving downtown, uh, and convoy supporters flooded the 911 system with calls. And I want to be very clear that I'm not suggesting that the trucker convoy was a product of Russian misinformation, because I don't think we know that. You know, some of the narratives concerning uh, Russian aggression that are coming out of some of the uh, elements of the United States Republican Party and even some news organizations like Fox News uh, have certainly raised some eyebrows. Um, you know, and, and we do have the American midterms coming up. There could be a shift in, in how the United States Congress is governed following those midterms. Uh, do we as a country, um, considering how successful some of the disinformation campaigns have been in the United States, do, do we as a country need to sort of uh, closely examine what the potential pitfalls from, from that disinformation campaign in the United States are? There's a few different th ways to think about this. One is the effect that it might have on um, swaying uh, an American election, both in the sense of whether there might be Russian interference, uh, but also just broadly in what direction the American people will decide to vote, because certainly um, some administrations and some policy positions will be easier for Canada to deal with than for others. Um, the other thing to be concerned about is the fact that um, individuals inspired by these kinds of narratives to uh, to take political action, whether it rises to the level of criminal activity or security activity, uh, could happen on either side of the border. The media landscape in Canada and the United States is very closely integrated, um, which is not to say that there aren't separate, um, separate causes in, in both countries, but we do see groups being inspired by each other across the border uh, and also groups that, that simply exist transnationally who, who might take action. So for Canada to sort of maintain and diversify our, um, our relations with the United States can, can help to, maintain, to make sure that our interests continue to be heard, even if we have a, a change in government. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, my first question, Dr. Ferguson, um, considering, you know, the misinformation uh, campaign, some people have been calling for uh, censorship. Uh, do you think that would backfire if, if the government were to engage in censorship? 
definitely it's going to backfire. I mean, as I've said, I don't agree that disinformation campaigns, and they're not all coming from Russia, uh, and issues about our information campaigns as well, has that much of a significant impact in terms of exploiting social differences. Thank you. Um, so I'd ask the same question to Dr. Kitchen. Uh, do you think that it would be more effective to fight misinformation with a, a vigorous campaign of uh, putting forward true information, or, or do you think censorship would be effective or would it backfire? I think certainly providing true information is always a good strategy, but to put, for true information to be effective, it has to come from institutions that people trust. And so maintaining that trust in institutions through transparency, as Dr. Hubert mentioned, uh, is vitally important. And would censorship undermine trust in those institutions, you think? Uh, quite possibly. Uh, just on the disinformation subject, there's been a lot of parallels between this study and our study into ideo ideologically motivated violent extremism and the way, uh, you know, major companies, social media companies, companies like Amazon can be exploited uh, using their algorithms and, and even in some cases like Amazon uh, using their platforms to sell hateful propaganda. So the potential exists for a determined state actor to take advantage of that if not through censorship, I mean, I, I think there's an argument to be made to remove untrue information. In what ways can the Canadian government effectively make sure that social media companies are not going to be vulnerable to these types of attacks? I think this this is where possibly regulation does become helpful is is um, regulation to make sure that we're getting rid of bots, making sure that we're getting rid of things that that act automatically and working together with those companies who are open to the idea of trying to control extremism, many of them on their platforms uh, is important. But it's also important to recognize that there are a whole series of secondary platforms where this kind of misinformation spreads that are um, that are a, a little more underground and less willing to work with government. Thank you. Mr. Ferguson, you stated that din disinformation is overblown and exaggerated and doesn't pose a real threat. It's as close to your quote as I could scribble at the time. And Mr. Hubert, I, I took from you that some of your quotes were that you were very concerned about Russian social media and the weaponization of social media. So I'm, tensing, uh, I'm sensing a bit of a difference there. If I could just get uh, maybe some clarification, firstly from Mr. Ferguson on the threat as seen by that, and then Mr. Hubert after that, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, my answer to that is, is simply the lack of confidence and trust in the public. You're certainly going to have small proportions, as Professor Kitchen pointed out, of extremists who can be manipulated, but they're already fertile ground to be manipulated. If you look at the overarching component of the public, who are more involved in this than I am, uh, I think we can trust them. I think they understand when they are being taken down the garden path. Uh, issues of the m small minority becoming radicalized and violent probably exist prior to any misinformation or disinformation, whatever you define that to be. Because one person's disinformation is another person's truth, and it's complicated. And I think we put too much of a scare sense, panic, if you will, around this without stepping back and saying, and I'll put this bluntly, Trump won the 2016 election, not because of the Russians. And that's an excuse that's then drawn out, dragged out to explain this anomaly, which the elites couldn't understand. Where I disagree and where I think that we're being complacent is when we look at the type of divides that we are now seeing in society. In other words, there's no question that this has been attempted before. We know that from the Cold War period, but now because of logarithms and the efficiencies of these new systems, I think the divides within Canadian society on the COVID issue alone illustrates that it's not just simply a, a sort of silent majority in the middle that is always going to get it. We see the divides between families and friends, and it's directly a part of the problem. I do have a question for Dr. Kitchen. Can you um, spend a little bit of time with us talking about uh, the specific concerns related to uh, misinformation or disinformation and the way in which it has it is started to, starting to have an impact on Canada, and in particular the ways in which you are seeing it impact uh, 
action in Canada, and if there are specific ties to international international actors, particularly Russia, would love to hear uh, your thoughts on that. Dr. Hubert already gave some of the some of the international examples. We also know that um, site identified uh, international um, attempt in at, attempts to influence the 2019 election. Um, we saw we've seen individuals who have been um, inspired by. Um, uh, Russian propaganda, for instance, there was a threat to the prime minister. I'm I'm blanking on the date uh, earlier earlier in the year. Um, so I think I think, but where where this is important is the way it interacts with tendencies that are already existing in Canadian society. So, for instance, the appeal of COVID uh, misinformation, where we will see Russia and other international actors uh, acting, is in trying to exacerbate those existing social polarizations. So, this is a Canadian problem that is exacerbated by foreign interference. Okay, very quickly then, Dr. Kitchen, if you could just follow up, where specifically uh, you talked about. COVID as one of the pockets of, misinf- of disinformation, misinformation. Where are some of these other pockets that you see um, this, this really starting to foment? And what are the concerns that you see? What trends are you seeing that concern you? Certainly the, the violence that we have seen um, in the COVID context against um, uh, Asian Canadians and other, other minority Canadians, I think we could see that replicated um, in uh, uh, possibly against Russians in Canada, possibly against Ukrainians in Canada. Um, we could also see uh, various other various other instances where racialized individuals are are being targeted because of the appeal of white supremacy that is in part promoted by by Putin's worldview, which is certainly of Russia as the leader of of Western, the correct leader of Rus- Western civilization uh, that you. helps to fuel those right wing extremist groups as well. To talk a little bit about some of what you said with respect to the Russian trolls, um, Dr. Al Rawi, you talked about their areas of interest right now being around the world. Can you talk about some of the other areas of interest that they are particularly uh, leaning into or curious about? Well, if you look uh, historically, the uh, Russian trolls trolls have been very much invested in supporting the far right in different countries, not only in Canada, but also in the US and in many places around uh, in Europe. The reason is to definitely create tension. And uh, uh, there is a term called edutainment, which means uh, making people really agitated, but at the same time, entertained. So that's uh, used, uh, that that is done through the use of, for example, uh, funny memes and uh, funny messages, but they are very much uh, militant, aggressive, and uh, often racist. Uh, So there is like a a pattern you can see. uh, This pattern shows that uh, the Russian trolls usually uh, align uh, themselves with uh, extremes, sometimes even with the far left. But that's the, the that's the strategy in general. And um, often the targets will be uh, the minority groups uh, and especially refugees and immigrants uh, in different countries. So the focus sometimes will be on the in the Netherlands and in the USA, but that will be the main issue. I hope I answered your question. Well, you, you did. I guess maybe we could dig a little bit into that. So you've talked about them being anti-Muslim, anti-immigrant, anti-refugee. You mentioned anti-liberal in the last election. Are they just anti or are they actually doing things to promote other causes? And are they pro certain things that we should be concerned about here in Canada? Yeah, I mean, I mean usually they, as I mentioned, they promote uh, far right groups. Uh, sometimes uh, they don't show like a lot of animosity towards conservative figures and politicians. But that kind of animosity is usually shown against liberals and NDP um, uh, figures. But, uh, you know, um, that's their strategy. Again, um, it's, it's about what aligns with their own worldview, what aligns with what they want to achieve. And it could uh, actually, it, it actually echoes with what Putin has in, in terms of his policies inside and outside Russia. So it makes a lot of sense. For instance, when they talk about the white helmets in Syria, they, they, are, they consider it a, a terrorist group because the white helmets is actually trying to undermine the Russian uh, efforts in Syria by uh, documenting uh, human rights uh, violations and so on. And they, and they do this with the help of uh, allies uh, as well as friends uh, from the region and elsewhere. My next question really is for you, but also I'd like, uh, once you're done, for Dr. Cooley to weigh in. You know, we had seen uh, a lot of the impact of 
uh, Russian misinformation in the January in the lead up to January 6th and in January 6th in the United States. There were there were clear links and support for so what was happening with the QAnon movement. Uh, there was a very successful attempt by Russian bots to try and tie what happened on January 6th to Antifa. There is evidence in the January 6th reports that show that there was a pro-Trump effort uh, on the part of, of Russian bots. And Harvard Law School professor uh, Yochai Benkler said that the primary goal of Russian propaganda is to quote create a world where nothing is true and everything is possible. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, the impact on Canada, and whether or not Canada needs to worry about those trends that were seen in the last, in the January 6th uprising in the U.S., and I'd like Dr. Cooley also to weigh in on that once you're done, sir. I, I think, yeah, we definitely need to be concerned because uh, the goal is to confuse people and make, the, make their vision of reality blurred in, in a way that they will not understand what is right and what is wrong, what is real and what is fake. And this is very concerning. And this is definitely related to what goes on in, in Ukraine in terms of also COVID-19 and so on. Like I can t talk a lot, but I think uh, maybe Dr. Kuli would, wants to also to add here. I would agree with that. I think from the Russian worldview, there's um, a, a, a sort of an outside world, which is this drive towards multipolarism, right? Not having the liberal West uh, dominate the international system, having spheres of influence, but there's a domestic internal component with that. And that is breaking down consensus for this kind of uh, movement to sort of, you know, collective liberalism, whether it's like NATO um, support for sort of transnational kind of cooperative solutions, um, uh, respect for sort of human rights and liberal values. So anytime they can poke holes in that, either by exacerbating partisanship or, or political polarization or targeting vulnerable communities, they will do that. And I, I, I want to emphasize this. The goal is not to make Russia look better. <laughs> right. That's that's not it really is to try and show what they think are contradictions and weak points in our own messaging and our own societal debates and take that from being a strength to somehow being a weakness of our own uh, domestic institutions. Um, my first question I, I, is for Dr. Al, Al Rawi. Um, we've talked about disinformation on social media, but we haven't really touched on platforms uh, that aren't quite as common as Facebook and YouTube and, and Twitter. And I'm, I'm thinking of platforms like Telegram and, and Gab, where they're positioned to appeal to extremist or fringe discussions. And I'm just wondering if you could talk about the impact of that in terms of Russian interference, and also if there are any recommendations you could meet, uh, make to the government on, on these less well-known platforms a few years ago a few United States and elsewhere were deplatformed from uh, mainstream social media like Facebook and Twitter including uh, for former President uh, Trump and uh, many conspiracy theorists like Alex Jones and so on this actually led uh, to what they call um, migration to new alternative outlets including the ones you mentioned telegram discord um, and uh, a few other ones. Uh, some of them, unfortunately, are even based in, um, in Canada. So uh, what we have today is uh, uh, platforms that are dominated by conspiracy and uh, theories and disinformation. Um, so we, in my study about, for example, the convoy protests, we found that uh, Twitter was... Uh, like uh, Twitter contained very little conspiracies in relation to uh, the uh, the protest, but we we found um, the, the dominant discourses or the conspiracies actually el are, el are elsewhere, like Telegram uh, specifically. Um, the ma major problem that uh, I am seeing is that the uh, big search engines like Google have indexed Telegram. So when I search, for instance, a message posted by Alex Jones on Telegram, I can actually find it. So I think that's the major problem. I, I do not think we can moderate these smaller platforms because the more you do, it's like uh, playing the guacamole game. The, the, the more you try to uh, silence one of them, four others will emerge because this is a, a thriving business for them. They are uh, actually profiting probably billions of dollars, not in maybe millions, billions of dollars. So I don't think... There is a way to completely stop these smaller social media platforms. But what we can do probably is to pressure the big search engines to index 
to less index these uh, sites okay. so that searching for specific content. And yeah, so that would, would be, be due with the algorithms that they use as well. Okay. There, there was a pledge in the last election to set up a financial crimes, uh, a federal financial crimes agency, and um, minister, the Minister of Public Safety's mandate letter instructs him to speed up work to establish a dedicated unit to investigate this. If you wanted to take uh, your minute and a half, can you expand on on the financial aspect of this issue that we're looking at? And does that in any way link to Canada's national security? Like, is this something that our committee should be focusing on when we make recommendations to the government? I, yes, I, I do believe it does uh, 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 influence national security. And especially because we've seen the outsized influence that so-called oligarchs or politically important persons with this extreme wealth have, right? They can influence... Um, um, certain part uh, political party positions. They can influence certain national campaigns. Um, through media contacts, they can set certain agendas. And of course, they can intimidate um, reporters uh, to prevent them from looking into their own origins of wealth. I actually think um, the move to a, a, a kind of a federal beneficial ownership registry is an absolute national security requirement. And whether this is 2025, 2023, it should happen as soon as possible. Um, I think every country needs to know what are the anonymous shell companies, who's behind them that are buying luxury real estate, but also other assets, right? Um, so I think anytime you put the norm of privacy and my client's privacy against transparency, Thank you. I think in this age, yeah, I think you're on the losing side. And my question is going to be for uh, Professor uh, Cooley, um, talking a lot about misinformation. Um, wondering if you're aware of, and you could comment on the well-documented misinformation campaign in the 2021 federal election. No, that, that's not my area of expertise. Or Mr. So Al-Warawi, because uh, there was a social media, I, I forget, WeChat, mm. I believe it was. Is this another uh, tool that's being used that is of concern? I would start with Dr. Cooley about um, the attempts of uh, foreign states to influence immigrant or diasporic groups in Canada. This has been an ongoing issue, so the WeChat uh, thing is, uh, is there. Definitely there is a clear evidence and uh, indication that the Chinese government has been uh, and is still trying to influence the uh, Chinese community living in Vancouver and elsewhere. Um, the uh, same applies uh, to the uh, you know other other states. For example, the Iranian government is very active in doing the same thing regarding uh, the Iranian communities living here in Canada. So this is an ongoing issue, and they usually target or you make use of specific tools or uh, let's say forums or means. Can you give us some examples of how that worked out? in the 2021 federal election? In the 2021 election, the, the WeChat uh, was um, uh, a clear uh, sign of this kind of interference. Um, and there are so many other gaps that we really do, do not really fully understand. One thing that I really like to highlight is the importance of studying ethnic Canadian media. Yeah, so, for example- Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. I'm sorry that we don't have more time. I'd like to start with um, Dr. Al-Rawi. Um, you spoke about uh, Russian bots and misinformation. Um, can you let us know if there were any, any um, were the bots trying to advantage any individuals or, or advantage any issues or disadvantage any issues aside from what you already did discuss and, and share with us? Yeah, I assume the question is about today, right? The yes. disinformation happening today. Thank you very much. Now, uh, scientifically, I mean, I cannot prove that these are bots because these are, are bots are automated accounts. What I have seen is that uh, some kind of organic users, which means real users spreading propaganda. Most of the propaganda that I have seen so far about the war on Ukraine are related to supporting the position of the Russian government and, of course, sending a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, what we call, let's say, uh, confusing messages. So, again, to blur our idea of what is happening and confuse people. Uh, and, and, they, and I think they are really uh, on top of the game because uh, they are very fast in making this kind of disinformation and spreading it. Unfortunately, I, we are late. Can I ask if the disinformation is both English and French and in any other languages aside from those two? 
I have seen on with regard to the uh, Russian diplomatic mission, it's mostly in English, but uh, definitely there is evidence that uh, it's in French. And uh, I never looked at the Telegram channel of uh, of uh, war on fakes. They have a, a huge Telegram channel, which is now one of the most popular in Russia. So now the the, the target will be also. In the last 45 seconds that are left, um, what are the impacts of disinformation? You mentioned diversity, inclusion, refugees, Muslims, uh, others. But what's the impacts, or the real impacts on these communities for the disinformation campaigns you mentioned? It's actually 10 seconds, please. Trying to make people mistrust uh, what is leg legitimate. Multiculturalism thank, included. Thank you very much. So thanks again for stopping by this guy's garage. I look forward to reading your comments because we read each and every comment that's made on this channel. They're so insightful. Share, like, and subscribe, and we'll see you on the next one because we're keeping an eye on things. This guy...